thanks. Ah, uh, yeah, the slides look fine. You still look fine, but you will not after my presentation has ended. Because today I'm going to talk about viewports, which is, I think, a topic that every web developer will have to understand. I'm going wrong with my microphone now, but not anymore. That is so cool. Um, I've given this presentation a few times. There are at least a few people in the audience who have seen it before. Um, I told that to somebody in San Francisco where I held the presentation a couple of weeks ago and said, yeah, oh, cool. That means that you have really rehearsed your jokes well. No, because there are no jokes. It's about the viewports. And it's something you will have to understand and you will have to study. Uh, it took me three years to get to the point where I could uh, explain them in a 40-minute presentation. It will take you less time to learn them because I did some work for you. Uh, let's give it two years, something like that. Anyway, viewports. What I really want to tell today is why responsive design works. Not how, you already know how, but why does it work? Why does that particular combination of tags and media queries work in mobile browsers? And um, before we can actually talk about that, we have to talk a little bit about pixels, because the humble pixel is uh, the fundament of websites and of CSS. Um, years ago, I wrote an article, A Pixel is Not a Pixel, still one of the most popular articles on my site. Um, it made people understand that there, was a, uh, there were two different kinds of pixels, namely CSS pixels and device pixels. And this may sound totally complicated to you, but don't worry, you already know what they are. You just don't realize you know. But still, it's important to make that distinction here and now before we go into the viewports. So CSS pixels, uh, they are the ones that we use when we use pixels in CSS, right? Uh, with 190 pixels, padding left 20 pixels, we use CSS pixels. And um, they are basically an abstract construct created specifically for us web developers so that we can just create CSS layouts without worrying about a few complicated issues such as, for instance, zooming. Because the fundamental thing about CSS pixels is that their size increases or decreases when you zoom, when the user zooms. That goes both on desktop and on mobile. We will get back to that a little bit later. In fact, we can get back to it now. Um, this is the example site I'm going to use in this presentation. It's uh, for one of our older conferences called Mobilism. Since Mobilism was about mobile web development, we made sure that the site was uh, decently responsive. But for most of this presentation, we are going to pretend that it's actually not responsive, but that it's a desktop optimized site, because that will teach you a few uh, tricks um, that are important for understanding what's going on with the viewports. So on the mobilism side, we have a left menu that has a width of 190 pixels, just coded hard in the CSS, nothing special here. What I'm going to show you now it was, uh, is what happens when you zoom in. It won't be a huge surprise to you. Oh, excuse me. Everything becomes bigger. The point I'm trying to make here is that this menu is still 190 pixels wide. But these are CSS pixels, and every individual CSS pixel has now scaled up a bit because the user zoomed. Again, this is a desktop example, but it works pretty much the same on mobile. Not entirely the same, though. I'll get back to that in a bit. So um, that's CSS pixels, and their main purpose is to make sure that uh, zooming and viewports work well, and you, as a web developer, don't have to think about it. The other kind of pixels is device pixels, and that's really simple. They are the physical hardware pixels on your device. Every single de uh, computing device with a screen has a certain number of hardware pixels that are just, uh, you know, electronics. You can't change that number in any way, and they're just there. Um, the best example uh, is uh, the iPhone. The old iPhones used to have 320 device pixels horizontally. Then the Retina iPhones came along and gave us 640 pixels horizontally. And that's the whole Retina effect, which I'm going to refer to a few times during this presentation. Uh, the point is that right now, um, a lot is being made of this kind of screen resolution, especially by mobile marketers. If you see uh, ads for the new Samsung or the new HTC or the new Sony or whatever, they all talk about how they cram more and more device pixels into their 
uh, devices. And that's, of course, technically possible. Um, what I personally think is that eventually we will hit a border somewhere where adding more device pixels doesn't actually improve the uh, quality of the screen because our human eye can see only so much. But I have no clue what that border is and whether we already reached it. It doesn't really matter for this presentation either. This is another way of looking at it. Um, this is an old computer screen where one CSX pixel was exactly equal to one device pixel. You know, back in the old days when you had an 800 by 600 monitor, and along came your boss and you said, here, my dear fellow, you have a 1024 by 768 now. And you thought, oh, that's so cool. I can see more stuff now. Why can you see more stuff? Because you have more device pixels, and back then, one CSS pixel was usually equal to one device pixel. Nowadays, that changed. Um, this, uh, for instance, is a retina screen. Uh, or similar, where one CSS pixel is equal to four device pixels, two by two. Uh, incidentally, you can get exactly the same effect by zooming to 200% on an old monitor, right? Because on an old monitor, initially a CSS pixel is equal to a device pixel, but when you zoom in to 200%, it goes to this, two by two. So that happens all the time, and you as a web developer don't have to worry about it because you've got your CSS pixels, and your CSS pixels uh, take care of all of this for you. That is why, in general, and nearly everywhere, both in CSS and in JavaScript, you are using CSS pixels. CSS, absolutely everywhere. JavaScript, nearly everywhere, with one single exception, as far as I know, and that is screen.width. And screen.width is an extremely serious problem that we're going to take a look at later on. Okay, with that introduction out of the way, let's talk about viewports. What exactly is a viewport? Uh, David already referred to a viewport in his presentation, but it was not really the focus of his presentation, so I'm going to tell you now exactly how it works. Again, the mobilism side. We have a container div here. And that container div has a padding left of 34%. Why? I don't know. Ask Stephen Hay. He designed it. Um, little trick. As soon as you see percentages anywhere in CSS, always ask yourself, percentage of what? Because usually that will teach you quite a lot about how CSS works. So let's uh, do that. Let's ask ourselves, 34% of what? Now, intuitively, we all know the answer. And the answer is the browser window on desktop. But why is that the case? So, general CSS rule, uh, if you use percentages in uh, widths or uh, related declarations, it is calculated relative to the width of the parent element. That's true throughout CSS. In this case, the parent element of our div is the body, which raises the question, what's the width of the body? Well, that's the second general CSS rule. Uh, every block level element including nowadays the HTML and the body element, has a default width of 100%, unless, of course, you set something else to CSS. That is kind of cool. So we get 34% of 100%. 100% of what? Of the width of the body's parent element, which is the HTML element. And there we get exactly the same problem. The HTML element is 100% wide, but 100% of what? Now we come to the viewport. Um, CSS has to have some way of uh, telling the browser, OK, your website may not be longer than this. Your website has to be constrained to this and this width. And that is the function of the viewport. It's called the initial containing block in the CSS specifications. And it's exactly that. It is a block that contains everything, including the HTML element. And the basic function of that block is to tell you, OK, you have so much space for your CSS layout, so all your percentages will be calculated relative to the initial containing block or the viewport. And on desktop, the viewport is equal to the browser window. And on mobile, it's a lot more complicated. That's what my talk is going to be about. Now. As I said before, when you zoom in, you basically enlarge the CSS pixels, right? That means that less of them fit in the browser screen. And that means that on desktop, the viewport becomes smaller. 
Here again, our site. The viewport right now is about 720 pixels. Uh, that's nothing fundamental. It's just uh, the way I took the screenshot. Now we zoom in again with the same step as we, uh, step as we did before. And now the viewport becomes about 580 pixels wide. Again, because of the specific way I took this screenshot. Um, you pretty much intuitively know all of this, and you don't really worry about it, which is good, because that's why the, why the viewports and the CSS pixels are here. But uh, in this presentation, I want you to take one step further and think about what exactly is going on. So that's the viewport, and as I said, on mobile, it's quite a bit more complicated. First, picture yourself in the shoes of a mobile browser vendor. Back in the day, let's say 2006, 2007, first iPhone was released, Google started working on Android, Nokia and BlackBerry started to understand that they needed a real browser on their phones. The problem back then was that there were no mobile-optimized websites. There were only desktop-optimized ones. We didn't call them that. But it was kind of natural for us to say, OK, so we've got 1024 pixels. Most of our users have 1024 pixels, so we make our website 1024 pixels wide. Which is cool for computer screens, but not for mobile browsers. So the problem the mobile browser vendors faced is figuring out a way of showing desktop-optimized websites on the mobile device. And the fundamental problem was that they could not literally copy the desktop concept of the viewport to mobile because the mobile screen's too small. I've got an example of that. Here, again, is our website, 34%, 190 pixels. Now I'm going to show you this website on a mobile phone, but we're going to pretend that the mobile phone does exactly the same as the desktop browser. And you get this. And that's ugly. I mean, technically, it's all correct, right? This is 34% off the screen. This is still 190 pixels wide, but this is absolutely not what we want. And again, remember back in those days, there were no mobile optimized websites yet. All, desktop, uh, all websites were optimized for desktop by default. So this was the problem the mobile browser vendors wanted to avoid. How did they do that? By changing the rules of the viewport. They said that by default, the viewport on a mobile browser is 768 to 1024 pixels wide. Depends on the browser, of course. Nowadays, 980 is the most common value because iPhone. It's going to be a recurring theme in this presentation, because iPhone. Um, so what you do now is say, OK, we need more space than the screen can provide for desktop-optimized websites. So OK, we give them more space. And this is what I call the layout viewport. And the layout viewport is by far the most important uh, one of the three mobile viewports I'm going to treat. The layout viewport serves to constrain your CSS layout, to tell CSS, OK, you have so many CSS pixels available to do your thing. And as far as I can see, responsive design is really the art of overriding this default width of the layout viewport. Because with responsive design, you say, OK, uh, that 768 to 1024 on a mobile browser makes sense in the context of de desktop optimized sites. But what we really want is to make it narrower so that it optimally fits the mobile device. We'll get back to that. So this is the layout viewboard. A mobile browser does roughly this. This is not a real screenshot, by the way. I made it up, but still. Um, the disadvantage, of course, of a wide layout viewport is that the site stretches out of the screen, but that cannot be helped. The mobile solution to desktop optimized website was not good, it was just the least bad option. However, the fact that we've now decoupled the viewport from the screen size means that we need a separate viewport for the actual width of the screen, of the actual window width of the browser of the actual mobile device screen. Because there are a few CSS declarations, such as uh, position fixed, that should be relative to what the user is currently seeing. And that's why we have a second viewport called the visual viewport. And that's this one. Layout viewport, visual viewport. 
Okay, brief detour to JavaScript. Can you read out the dimensions of the layout and visual viewport? Yes, you can. Document, document element client width and client height uh, gives you the size of the layout viewport in just about every browser. And when I say just about every browser, I mean not five, but 50, because I tell testing 50 browsers. And you bet I tested this. Because this was already two, uh, three years ago when I uh, started my testing, and I did not believe it. I thought, okay, some, there has to be some kind of catch here, and something has to go wrong somewhere. It didn't. It actually works. Also on the desktop browsers, by the way. Visual viewport, window.inner width, and window.inner height. This has slightly different uh, compatibility pattern. Uh, the most important thing is that it doesn't work in Android WebKit 2, which is the default browser for crappy old Android devices, and the Opera Mini, and also in UC8. You know about UC browser, right? You know about the UC browser, right? Ah, somebody. Um, biggest browser in China. Uh, UC8, by the way, is a completely ridiculous browser. UC9 is a lot better. Doesn't matter. Unless you're working for the Chinese market and you have to get acquainted with UC in a hurry. Worldwide mobile browser market share about 10% now. Mostly in China and in India. Doesn't matter. Anyway, um, the desktop viewport has now been successfully split into two. The layout viewport for constraining the, uh, your CSS layout and the visual viewport for denoting what the user is actually seeing right now. However, there's a third mobile viewport, and that third mobile viewport has no direct equivalent on the desktop, and I call it the ideal viewport. By the way, a layout viewport and visual viewport, the terms originally came from Opera, because when I was doing my initial research, I talked to Anna van Kesteren and was searching for names, and he said, yeah, internally in Opera, we call it the layout viewport and the visual viewport. I said, yeah, cool, let's do that. Ideal viewport is wholly my own invention. Thank you. So, what is the ideal viewport? Um, the previous screenshot about a desktop optimized site in a mobile browser was not entirely true. What mobile browsers usually do is this. They um, take the default layout viewport of 768 to 1024, they render the site in that layout viewport, and then they zoom out as much as they can so that their users can see as much as, of the site as possible. Again, this is not a good solution, it's just the least bad solution. But what mobile browser vendors want, of course, is to get a width of a website that is ideally suited to their specific device. And that is where the, uh, where the ideal viewport comes in. Um, the mobile browser vendors want to make sure that when the user lands on a page, he doesn't have to zoom, pan, and can read the text immediately. And that's why they created the ideal uh, viewport, which is basically just a width and a height, uh, defined somewhere deep inside the browser itself. If you use this width and height for the layout viewport, then your site will uh, be displayed optimally on this specific device. That's the promise that the ideal viewport makes. And then you get a proper responsive design. You set the layout viewport to the ideal viewport, and then you use media queries to figure out what's going on and adjust your CSS. And that's when you get a proper responsive design. Now, I have been uh, using the BlackBerry Z10 as my uh, example device so far. That's for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that I want uh, to impress you with the idea that there's more than just iPhone and Android. Nowadays, I admit there's not much more, but there's still more, BlackBerry and Windows Phone. The second reason I do that is because it has a fairly odd layout viewport, 342 by 570. Um, you were probably thinking of the iPhone. The old iPhone had 320 by 480. The newer models have 320 by 568. That's the ideal viewport of the iPhone. iPad has 768 by 1024. I just want to show you some completely different values. And I want to impress you with the fact uh, that there are no wrong dimensions for the ideal viewport. 
I tested this on 50 browsers, as I said. A few browsers don't have an ideal viewport at all, but all of the rest have uh, sensible values for the device they run on. So there is no wrong ideal viewport. Uh, all ideal viewports are exactly what they need to be for the device they run on. Admittedly, there are weird ideal viewports, but they're not wrong. Okay. Example time, because in addition to uh, making the site ideal for the device, uh, the ideal viewport also serves as a useful uh, abs abstraction layer on top of uh, devices so that we web developers, again, don't have to worry about stuff. For instance, the old iPhone 3G and before had 320 device pixels, right? And the ideal viewport was also 320 pixels. Along came the Retina iPhones, and they had 640 device pixels, but the ideal viewport stayed at 320. And that was, of course, totally deliberate. There were two reasons for that. First of all, uh, 320 pixels is genuinely the best size for a website on the iPhone, given its uh, physical uh, length, uh, uh, width. And secondly, if Apple would suddenly change that, a lot of websites would break. Because by the time the Retina screens came out, there were already a lot of mobile-optimized sites, and they all assumed uh, a width of 320 pixels. If it would suddenly become 640, it would be terrible. So this points to the usefulness of uh, the ideal viewport as an abstraction layer. right? The ideal viewport works around differences between various iPhones for you. Much more importantly, the ideal viewport works around the differences on various Android devices for you. Because I have lost count of how many Android devices there are. Only a few days ago I heard a number like 12,000 or something. They don't all have different um, screen, screen sizes, but a lot of them do. But fortunately, what I found during my research is that most Android browsers use one of three ideal viewports, 320, 360, or 400. So if you make sure that your website uh, performs well and your uh, responsive design performs well on 320 pixels, 360 pixels, and 400 pixels, you've got about 80% of the, uh, the Android market covered. And here we see the true power of the ideal viewport as an abstraction layer that covers device differences for us. So, can we read out the ideal viewport by JavaScript? No, we can't. Um, here we touch on screen.width and screen.height. And what I found during my research is that uh, right now in the mobile world, uh, there are two competing definitions. Some browsers, including uh, Safari and Chrome, define screen width and height as the dimensions of the ideal viewport, which is exactly what we want to know. But other browsers, including Android WebKit, which is the old default browser for Android, define them still as the number of device pixels on the screen. And you don't know what you're going to get. Which means that effectively, no, you cannot read out the dimensions of the ideal viewport. Incidentally, all this means that if you go to your nice uh, analytics package and take a look at mobile resolutions, the data is completely worthless because mobile resolutions are gathered by reading out screen.width and screen.height, and there are two competing definitions. So uh, I advise you not to pay any attention to whatever your analytics package is saying about uh, resolutions, because you have to interpret them a lot, and you have to know exactly what you're doing then. So, um, yeah, this is bad news. Fortunately, this is by far the worst mobile uh, browser incompatibility we're going to encounter during this presentation. Most of the rest works in most browsers. Okay. We have a layout viewport. That layout viewport constrains the layout, uh, our CSS layout, makes sure that all percentages are um, interpreted relative to some sensible value. In addition, we have the ideal viewport, and the ideal viewport tells you, okay, ideally on this device, the layout viewport should be this and this wide. What you want to do for responsive design is setting the layout viewport width to the ideal viewport width. And that's where we come to the meta viewport. This. 
That is the meaning of with equals device with in the meta viewport. So, recap. By default, that layout viewport that constrains your CSS layout is 768 to 224 pixels wide, most common value 90, 980 because iPhone. Then you can add, if you like, the meta viewport tag and set the width of the layout viewport to a value of your choice. That value may be a pixel value, such as width equals 400, but 95% of the time we use the device width keyword, keyword, which gives us the ideal viewport width. And the advantage, of course, is that you are now totally sure that your layout viewport has the ideal size for the device it runs on. But you still don't know what that value actually is. You need media queries for that, and we'll go to, we get back to them later. So, I'm kind of assuming this does not really surprise you after my lengthy talk about uh, uh, layout viewports and ideal viewports, but I do hope that the next item is going to surprise you because it turns out there's a second way of doing exactly the same and it works in, excuse me, and it works in all browsers, and that's this. Setting the initial scale to one. That's the same. Why, I have no clue. Now, in theory, uh, scale is Apple speak for zoom. In theory, what initial scale does is set the initial zoom level where one is equal to 100%. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. 100% of what? What does this 100% refer to? Is it a visual viewport, the thing the user is currently seeing? No, it's not. Then it might be the layout viewport that constrains your CSS layout. No, it's not either. It turns out to be the ideal viewport. Don't ask me why I have no clue. But this is how it works. So we set the initial zoom level to 100% of the ideal viewport. OK, let's move on. It turns out that it also sets the layout viewport dimensions to the ideal viewport. Again, in all browsers. And this does not make sense. It gets even weirder when you change the value, when you change the value to initial scale 2, for instance. Um, now, the, the order in theory is, OK, zoom into 200% of what? Of the layout viewport, uh, excuse me, of the ideal viewport. And that actually happens. But a lot of browsers now also set the layout viewport to half the ideal viewport. Why half? Because zooming means the CSS pixels stretch out and less of them fit on the screen. So on an iPhone, this would give a, uh, a layout viewport of not 320, but 160. Try it if you don't believe me. One exception, Android WebKit, the old uh, Android default browser, uh, obeys only the value 1 and not any of the other values. Why? I have no clue. Okay, so this is weird, and I admit it, and I don't understand it. <laughs> now comes the fun part, the fun part of doing browser compatibility research. Uh, once you have established these rules and properly tested them in 50 browsers, you can start to mess things up, and that's fun. I'm like a child at play. So how did I mess things up? Like this. Now, I'm giving the browsers conflicting instructions. On the one hand, I tell it, OK, set the layout viewport to 400 pixels, if you please. But then I tell it, nah, never mind. Set it to the ideal viewport width, which mysteriously initial scale equals 1 does. What do browsers do now? When I first uh, did this test, I expected browsers to be all over the place, right? To, uh, to have weird incompatibility incompat patterns that would take me days to discover. It turns out that's not the case. It turns out that all browsers do the same. They take the highest value. And so what we're saying here, basically, is, dear browser, please set the layout viewport to either 400 pixels or the ideal viewport width, whichever of the two is larger. And the really fun thing is that if you change the device orientation, that's recalculated. So what we he have here, in effect, is a way of setting the minimum width of a layout viewport. Again, iPhone is an example. In portrait mode, you would get 320 pixels or 400. Largest is 400, so you get 400. In landscape mode, you get 400 or 480. Largest is uh, 480, so you get 480. 
Uh, there is no way anymore for the layout viewport to become smaller than 400 pixels. I discovered this back in November, and uh, in all the, what is it, seven, eight months in between, I have been wondering, is this actually useful? I don't know. Um, so what I'd like to ask you is if you can think of a practical real-world use case for this, please do let me know. I'm going to ask it at, at uh, every conference I do uh, until the end of the year. If I haven't gotten a satisfactory answer by the end of the year, I'm going to assume that this is kind of cool but totally useless. But I'm not 100% sure yet. Maybe somebody will come up with something. In any case, be aware that you can set a minimum width to the layout viewport, if you so desire. Okay, safari time. That's so fun. Um, most of you will know that if you use this in Safari, that it will always, uh, always take the portrait width of the ideal viewport. 320 on the iPhone, 768 on the iPad, even when you go to landscape mode. Um, sometimes this is actually what you want, and other times it's not. My personal guess is that uh, Apple did this um, to avoid uh, a complex recalculation of the uh, layout every time you uh, switched orientation. But I'm not sure about that anymore because modern iPhones do the same and they have much better hardware. Anyway, can we solve this? Actually, yes, we can. Because if you use initial scale equals one, then the Safari does it right. 320, 480, or 568. Why? I have no clue, but it works. And all other browsers do the same, except for Internet Explorer 10, which has exactly the opposite value. <laughs> you can't make this up. Nobody would believe you, but it's true. So how do we solve that? Can we make a true cross-browser uh, viewport? Yes, we can. We just add the two values. We just use them both. Initial scale works for Safari. Device width works for IE 10. All, both work for all other browsers, and this is the perfect meta viewport. So please use this meta viewport in your sites, and not just with equals device width. Um, then we've got at viewport. Because what we are doing with the whole meta viewport tag is a bit weird. What we are doing is saying, okay, we have this thing that is totally important to CSS, and we set its value in HTML, which kind of doesn't make sense. Uh, a few years ago, Opera thought the same, and they said, okay, we should port this to CFS and call it the add viewport rule. Um, Opera supported this in the Presto uh, rendering engine, but when they went over to Blink, uh, this was lost. Right now, only IE supports this syntax. And um, actually, there's an interesting story to that. Because it turns out, oh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, in IE10 it's prefixed, in IE11 you can use either the prefixed or the unprefixed version. And the point here is that in IE, uh, in IE on Windows Phone, this gives you the true ideal viewport. And what do I mean by that? Uh, what I mean is that when you use the meta tag, you always get 320 pixels on in IE, regardless of the exact device. Why? Because iPhone, right? This is our fault as web developers, right? We pay attention only to the iPhone, so the other browser vendors have to say, okay, then we're going to emulate the iPhone. Which means that the meta viewport tag gives, always gives you 320 pixel ideal viewport. But when you use this, you get the true ideal viewport. In other words, the viewport that works best on the actual device. I tested this on only one device, it's on a, Lumia, a Nokia Lumia 820, and the true ideal viewport turned out to be 364 pixels. Again, a weird value, but it's not wrong. So what I'm saying here is that in order to keep uh, IE on board, oh, and I have heard, but not tested, I've heard from the IE team, but I have not personally tested, that the ad viewport overrides the meta tag, but I still have to test that. Which means that this is the even perfecter meta viewport. You add this in your CSS for IE, you add this in your HTML for all other browsers, and everybody will get a perfect ideal viewport. 
which is kind of cool. Okay, let's talk about media queries. We now have set the, uh, the width of the layout viewport, which serves to constrain your CSS layout, to the ideal viewport, which is ideally suited to the device. But you, as a web developer, still don't have a clue what that ideal viewport actually is. And that's where media queries come into play. I kind of assume you've all seen a media query, right? Match width 600, which means uh, for widths up to 600 pixels. But what does width mean? In this respect, there's two important media queries, width and device width. And width is the one you want. I'm very uh, sorry to have to tell you that if you're using device width, you are doing it wrong. And I will show you why in a minute. Um, because device width on desktop tells you how wide the device screen is, and you don't care about that information. You don't care about the device width, you only care about the width of the browser screen. Now, on mobile, initially, it may seem that device width actually has useful information because it gives you the screen width, which is something that you do want to know. The problem is that the device width media queries are always equal to the value of screen.width in all browsers. And screen.width has two conflicting definitions ideal viewport, or the number of device pixels. So if you use the device width and device height media query, you never know what you're going to get. In some browsers, notably Safari and Chrome, it works perfectly fine. You get the ideal viewport. But in other browsers, notably the old Android WebKit, you, uh, you are doing it wrong because you get the screen size and device pixels, which is not what you need to know. That's why you should never use the device width media query. Instead, you should use width. Because width always, in all browsers, gives you the size of the ideal viewport. Uh, excuse me, of the layout viewport. And that is what you want to know. So on desktop, it's equal to the width of the browser window, which is the information you're after. And on mobile, it's the width of the layout viewport, which is also the information you're after, especially after if you've constrained the layout viewport to the ideal viewport so that it fits the screen perfectly. <coughs> Um, and it works always and everywhere, 50 browsers. And then, when you combine the meta viewport with the width media query, you get a proper responsive design. And that's kind of why responsive design worked. I mean, all of you already knew the code you had to add to your website in order to magically invoke responsive design. I hope I've taught you why it works. Set the layout viewport width to the ideal viewport width. You may uh, use another value if you like, but hardly anybody ever does that. Use the width media query to figure out how wide that is and adjust your CSS. And um, oh, one more thing about media queries before I move on. Always use min or max. Never use just width. Because a breakpoint is, OK, these styles are valid for all widths up to and including x, or x and higher, and not just x. Um, there's plenty of people who use 320 as an exact width because iPhone. But there's more than just the iPhone. Remember the 342 of the BlackBerry Z10. Remember the 364 of uh, IE on the Lumia uh, A20, there is more than just 320 pixels. What we'd like to do with responsive design, however, is not just what we're already doing, but also reacting to the physical size of the device. For instance, it would be cool if you could set a minimum width of 25 real life millimeters, and I'm here to tell you that you can't. It is impossible to know anything about the physical device with the current CSS and JavaScript. And in order to uh, understand why, we have to take a brief look at CSS units. Um, because in CSS, width 25 millimeters does not actually mean 25 real life millimeters. Instead, it means 94.488 pixels. Why is that? 
Um, because in a sense, cent centimeters, millimeters, and inches are fake units in the sense that they don't correspond to their real life uh, values. And the root cause of this is that one inch in CSS is defined as 96 pixels. You can test that if you like, just create a block of one inch and a block of 96 pixels. They stay exactly the same size, even when you zoom. Right, because when you zoom, the CSS pixels stretch up, so the 90, uh, 96 pixels take, on, take up uh, more of your screen, and the one inch block does exactly the same, because one inch is defined as 96 pixels. Um, these are the CSS unit definitions. Um, you can read them later when I've published my slides. And I used to think that this was a really bad idea. I used to love the idea of saying, OK, I want to make sure that my navigation links on my mobile website are at least 25 millimeters wide, real life millimeters. But I've changed my mind because I started thinking about how much effort the browser would have to take in order to do that. Because mobile zooming is uh, rather different from desktop zooming. Um, if you zoom in on mobile, the CSS pixels stretch up and less of them fit in the screen, in the visual viewport, but the layout viewport size doesn't change, so nothing has to be recalculated. If you would use something like this, something like uh, real-life millimeters, then that would mean that the browser would constantly have to recalculate everything when the user zoom, and uh, zooming happens a lot on mobile. So purely for performance issues, I don't think we are ever going to see this in real life, because it just takes up too much processor time and too much bat battery life on mobile where they are scar scarce. So that's too bad. Um, and finally, I'm going to dash your last hope, resolution. Uh, some people seem to think that resolution tells you something about the real world device. It does not. The complicated part here is that uh, there's really two types of resolution. When you read uh, mobile uh, ads from mobile device vendors or specs from mobile devices, you will often see a DPI value, which is just the number of hardware pixels divided by the actual number of inches that the device is wide. And as far as they go, these numbers are correct. Uh, it's just nothing that you as a web developer can use. Because uh, resolution in CSS and JavaScript does not mean what you think it means. Right, we've got this. We've got device pixel ratio in JavaScript, and you can read it out if you like. And you have two media queries in CSS uh, for <coughs> browser compatibility reasons. Uh, the main device pixel ratio is necessary for the WebKit-based browsers, while the resolution media query works in all non-WebKit-based browsers. So for now, you need both. And uh, this is a minor browser incompatibility. It's not really important. What I want to treat here is exactly what are you saying here? What is a device pixel ratio? What's a resolution? Um, it turns out, I tested this in 50 browsers, that device pixel ratio is the ratio of the screen size in device pixels and the ideal viewport size. That's what resolution means in CSS and JavaScript. For instance, the old iPhone 3G had 320 device pixels. Ideal viewport was also 320, so we get a device pixel ratio of 1. The newer iPhone 4S with retina screen, 640 device pixels, 320 ideal viewport, so device pixel ratio equals 2. Samsung Galaxy Pocket, which is a fairly crappy, fairly old Android device I bought for testing. Incidentally, if you do serious mobile testing, I advise you to buy a fairly old, fairly crappy Android device, because plenty of people still have them. So you should test them. Then. Anyway, this is a really tiny phone. It still runs Android 2.3, I think. And that's perfect for my testing, because I love testing on crappy phones. Um, because it's old and small, it has only three, uh, 240 device pixels. But the ideal viewport size of the browser is still 320, because iPhone, which gives us a device pixel ratio of 0 0.75. Finally, the BlackBerry Z10, 768 device pixels. 342 ideal viewport, which gives us this device pixel ratio. <laughs> Again, this is weird, but not wrong. Your code should uh, account for this kind of stuff. 
always use min resolution or min device pixel ratio. Okay, we've near the end of my presentation. Finally, a plug. I'm currently writing a book, the mobile web handbook, uh, which has an entire chapter devoted to what I just told you, plus a few other things. Um, you're all required to, uh, to buy a copy because I need money. And um, it ships, I hope, in late June, maybe in uh, July, published by Smashing Magazine and for sale now. With that, my presentation has come to an end. I will put these slides online, probably later today. And we are now going to have the nice interview with the nice gentleman. Thank you. Okay, thanks. It's kind of like, feels like sitting with my boss. I'm not sure why that. A right. <laughs> lot of questions. Okay. Um, including this one. Which viewport is used for the VW and VH units? Ha! Huh. That depends on the browser, of course. It should be the layout viewport, right? If uh, VW and VH, you all know those. Uh, who doesn't know those units? Not too many. Okay. Uh, briefly, VW, viewport width, VH, viewport height. They are relative to the viewport, which is actually an important question you should always ask yourself. Uh, lots of CSS specification and articles talk about the viewport. And my first question is always, which viewport? And this, uh, it's a very relevant question here. Uh, it should be relative to the layout viewport, so the, to the, uh, your constrained CSS layout. But in some browsers, it's relative to the visual viewport, which means that it actually changes when you zoom, which is kind of cool but also wrong, I think. And in Safari, it's relative to the HTML element and not a viewport at all. Though I recently heard that in some cases that may not entirely be true, and I still have to uh, do some research on that. But uh, yeah. <laughs> so we're getting to the point where we kind of want like simple answers to all these yeah, questions, yeah. I guess. Uh, are, are there more events that create unexpected zoom on the page? I, I, I more events that create unexpected zoom on the page? They're unexpected zooming. Unexpected um, zooming, yes. No, I've never, has anyone ever seen unexpected zooming? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Uh, the, Oh, that, um, the, yeah, um, no, as far as I know, that's Safari only problem. Well, the, it's on input fields, exactly, yeah. So when you, uh, how to prevent zoom when clicking on a text input field or change in orientation without blocking user print zoom? I have absolutely no clue. <laughs> 16 pixel font size. 16 pixel font size. Okay. 16 pixel font size. It doesn't really make sense to me, but maybe it works. I mean, few things make sense on mobile, so this may actually be true. Okay. Um, how many versions do you need to make to get your site ready for all devices? How many versions? Versions? Um, I don't know. All devices? 20,000? 30,000? <laughs> Um, the question is here, um, what do you consider important for your website? And there's only one way of figuring that out, and that's looking at the log files. And saying something like, I will test in all devices that have over 2% share, whatever, make up a number. Uh, but I advise you to, that, to do that or go completely mad because there are just too many devices out there. Personally, uh, I mean, I test on a lot more devices than the average web developer because I do uh, compatibility testing. I would advise uh, an iPhone, an iPad, um, two or three Android devices at the very least from different vendors with different an uh, uh, Android versions and different resolutions. A uh, Windows phone, a BlackBerry, and maybe an old Nokia, if you're so inclined. That would be the minimum uh, device test lab I would advise. Just out of curiosity, how many devices do you have at home? 35, plus eight tablets. Okay, so it's not that bad. It's not that bad. No, 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 no. Uh, people don't send me devices anymore. That's a problem. Okay, and um, I'm leading the witness again here, but if you, uh, would you say there's uh, the way that you build your sites? Um, I mean, we could think in terms of mobile first, but or structured content first, or something like that. That that has an effect on how many devices or how much you have to change when you do after you do testing on different devices. I would say that mobile, uh, to me, mobile first is not something technical, but more like a philosophical concept. 
So in theory, the answer is no, because mobile first is just a way of figuring out which content is so important that it has to be shown even on the tiny mobile screen, which is totally cool to know uh, in the context of your whole project, but it won't help you technically. In practice, though, I think it does help because it focuses you on mobile uh, immediately, and you immediately start uh, to design responsively, which I think is the most important thing right now. I mean, I would personally phrase it as start designing responsively with the smallest, uh, with the smallest screen size you're going to target. So 320, maybe even the 240 of the Samsung Galaxy Pocket, if you like it. And do you, uh, what's your opinion on, uh, on specific, like, device-based media queries? Device-based media queries? Well, if you, uh, media queries based on specific device uh, si screen sizes. I... So you have the, you know, the iPhone media query, the no. iPad media yeah. query, et cetera. I don't really like them. Mostly because it's actually something you taught me that uh, breakpoints in media queries should al uh, always uh, obey the graphic design and not. Well, yeah, I, I know they're evil, but I'm just wanting to hear oh, it okay. from you. Okay, That's okay. yeah. <laughs> so uh, ask him. Ask him. He, he knows all about that. So basically, the theory is you you create a design and then you just start to uh, uh, stretch up your browser window until the design looks really crappy and then you insert another breakpoint. Do not do it for specific devices. Because sure, you can start with the 320 and the 768 for the iPhone and iPad, but you are going to get into trouble sooner or later with some obscure Android that doesn't entirely follow your rules. Okay, well, we're out of time, so thank you, PPK. Thank you.